from Columbia in high definition. This is WIS News 10 Awareness. Good morning and thank you for joining us for Awareness. I'm your host, Megan Norman. We have a full show for you today about taking care of your health and looking at the achievement of several students and women in our communities. First, award-winning actress S. Epatha Merkerson has had an outstanding career in television, theater, and film. But many people don't know she is one of millions of African Americans living with diabetes. It is a major health concern that can lead to other complications. Len Keyes spoke with Merkerson about diabetes and how she's encouraging others with the disease to reach their blood sugar goals through America's Diabetes Challenge. I was at a health fair and uh, I, I was the celebrity for the day. So I went to the little cooking area to cook nutritious food, went to the exercise area to exercise, went to the medical table, had my blood sugar taken. And when it was all over, the doctor said to me, can you come back? I want to, uh, I thought he wanted an autograph or maybe a photograph or something. And he asked me to, redo my blood sugar. And it turns out my blood sugar level was very high. That's how I found out. And that's what's so interesting about this uh, type two diabetes is that it affects differently, it, people differently. And so even though I have a history of it in my family, I did not recognize any of the symptoms. So now, after all of that, you're involved now with America's Diabetes Challenge. Tell us about that challenge and what you're, you're asking folks to do out there. Well, we're asking people to know, uh, to encourage people who have type 2 diabetes like me to, to find out what their A1C number is. You know, as a diabetic, I take my blood sugar twice a day, but an A1C test allows your doctor to get an overview say of a two or three month period of how you're managing your blood sugar and then it be blood sugar levels and then it becomes a great opportunity and way for the two of you to sit down and talk about the lifestyle changes that you'll have to make to attain your blood sugar goal your a1c goal and that's diet exercise and and uh and a medicine if you're prescribed. And of course it's going to affect anyone. Just how prevalent is this in the African American community? Well, you know, there are five, five million African Americans in this country that have type 2 diabetes, that have diabetes. And so it's important that we start having this dialogue about uh, A1C and, and knowing that this is a manageable condition. I think if if I would impress upon on our community, that would be the biggest thing, is that it is a manageable disease. We can be proactive in our health care by knowing what our A1C is, by having that conversation with the doctor, and by attaining that A1C goal. Now, kidney disease is just one condition that can result from diabetes. If you combine it with high blood pressure, doctors say that increases your risk of developing kidney disease. And family history, of course, adds to that risk. For the last six months, I've been working to educate you about how to prevent kidney disease. Everett German had no family history of kidney disease, but he had a habit of not eating right not exercising enough, and no regular checkups, also known as a perfect storm. I was just having really bad headaches and blurred vision in, in my eyesight and kind of just thought maybe it was just time that I needed glasses. It was far more serious than needing glasses. When German finally went to the doctor, it was a life or death decision. His blood pressure was sky high. He goes, your blood pressure right now is 220 over 160. He said, you literally are a walking stroke. And after some tests, that's when they discovered that I had, um, at that time, only 12% functioning left in my kidney. So I was at stage five before I even uh, knew anything about you know, my kidney failure. It's your kidney's main job to remove waste and excess fluid from your body. If this is not happening properly, doctors say you may feel fatigue, muscle cramps, swelling, and more. But kidney disease does not always have symptoms, so you need to know your risk. 
The two biggest causes of kidney failure are diabetes and high blood pressure. Nazisa Mutinga is a nephrologist. To a large extent, it can be prevented. Um, diabetes is a preventable illness, and that's why we really must focus on screening the appropriate people and then making sure they have good follow-up and treatment. Dr. Matinga says blood and urine tests tell doctors how well your kidneys are functioning. There are five stages of kidney disease, and once you get to limited kidney function around stages four or five, Dr. Matinga recommends talking about treatment options. Now, early stages can be managed with medication, but catching it before it's progressed can be life-saving. You just always say, it won't happen to me, it can't happen to me. You know, I work out all the time, I eat proper, and it may decrease your chances, but yeah, you just can't be stubborn when it comes to your health. You know, you only get one life, you only get, you know, necessarily one body, you gotta take care of it. Now, African Americans are at an increased risk of developing kidney disease. When the kidneys start shutting down, dialysis is one treatment option. Some people stay on dialysis for years. Others opt for a life-saving transplant. The man we just met, Everett German, made the choice to change his life for the better. Canyon dribbling left. Now going right down the lane with the right hand layup. Good. One of the voices of College of Charleston basketball. You are watching the dog pound. On Everett German has been doing play-by-play -play for years. But close to 10 years ago, he was sidelined by his health and at first did not know why. I was just having really bad headaches and blurred vision in, in my eyesight and kind of just thought maybe it was just time that I needed glasses. When German went to the doctor, his blood pressure was checked. He said, I can't believe you're sitting here. And I'm like, you know, what do you mean? He goes, your blood pressure right now is 220 over 160. He said, you literally are a walking stroke. German says he was then told he had only 12% function of his kidneys left. I was at stage five before I even uh, knew anything about, you know, my kidney failure. No family history of kidney disease, no diabetes, and no idea he had high blood pressure. The fact that I wasn't feeling bad is why it didn't really, you know, alert me or alarm me that I probably needed to go and get checked out. German says his days are busy, full of family and work. He says he often neglected regular checkups. It just had to do with me and choices that I made in terms of, you know, uh, not eating properly and, you know, not exercising as much as I probably should have been and just a bunch of things put together made for a perfect storm which you know a lot obviously caused me to have the hypertension and led to kidney failure. He managed the kidney failure with medication for a few years but knew he needed a transplant. His sister Charlene was a match. You never really realize how bad you felt until you feel good again. This summer, German will be four years strong with a new healthy kidney. He has more energy to keep up with what's going on on the court and at home. Get those checkups, you know, just stay on top of your health. Because uh, a lot of times if you catch it early enough, it won't get to the point where you would have to uh, either get on dialysis or get a kidney transplant. Not knowing is not an excuse anymore. Th this Thursday is World Kidney Day. Join WIS on Wednesday, where we'll have experts in-house to talk about screening for kidney disease, treatment options, and how to become an organ donor. But next on Awareness, promoting scholastic success, an event this week to recognize the academic achievement of several Midland students. Welcome back to Awareness. We're celebrating academic achievement. This weekend, several high school students will be rewarded for their hard work and encouraged to go farther. The Angie Kennedy Educational Foundation is hosting its fourth annual signature event. Joining me now is the founder and board president, Lloyd Ballard. Lloyd, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. So tell me why you started this foundation several years back. Well, the reason I started this foundation was in 2006, my grandmother, Miss Angie Kennedy, she passed in 2006. And I really wanted to come up with a way to honor the legacy and the life that she led. And this was the perfect opportunity to use that scholarship, scholarship foundation to actually do that. Right, and the scholarship opportunities, therefore, high school and college students? Yes. Okay, and who qualifies for these? What are the qualifications to be a recipient? Well, one of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure that our scholarships 
weren't just for the high achievers. Hmm. We wanted those students who may not get an opportunity to actually apply for a scholarship. So our GPA qualification is really at 2.5. Okay. And as long as they complete that, and there's some other things that they have to do in terms of our criteria, like there's a questionnaire that must be completed, there's an essay, mm -hmm. and they must um, have three letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, but that's and so, and so do you not just focus on the academic achievement, but more of a holistic success of the person? Yes, we, we like to really ask them, there's some, some key questions. One of the key questions is, how will you use your degree or your vocational uh, certificate or mm -hmm. training to benefit not only yourself, but how can you use that to benefit your family, your community, Right. So we want them to be able and to be able to give back, but to also think about giving back. Sure, think about their impact. That's right. Now, is there a specific vocation or or major that they need to have? No, okay. in fact, um, no. In fact, there is one specific. We have what we call the Victoria Victoria Carter Scholarship, mm -hmm. and that one deals with the arts. So it's someone that's involved in the arts, right. but. You don't have to have a particular major or vocational interest. Well, let's talk about the event this weekend, the fourth annual signature event. Yes. And eight students are going to be honored. Yes, yes. We're really, really um, happy about this because every year what we see is the number of scholarships growing. Mm -hmm. And to be able to award eight scholarships for us is really big. We're looking to increase those numbers significantly right. next year. But this year, for our fourth signature event, it's going to be held in Orangeburg, South Carolina, mm -hmm. at the premiere. It will start at 4.30 p.m. Um, it will start with a silent auction. We would at least allow people to view the items, and then the formal program will start, which includes dinner, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Our keynote speaker for the event is Jamie Harrison. The which Democratic is, Party. That's right. Statewide. Right. So he's agreed to be our keynote for the event. Well, and one thing I, I want to point out is these students, they come from a wide range of backgrounds as well. I know five students are from the Orangeburg County area, but there are several others that are international students. Yes, we actually have two students from the Washington, D.C. metro area, mm -hmm. from Northern Virginia, as well as Maryland. And we also have another student from Barbados. That's great. And this is our first year going international. Right. Um, well, and it's really important, I think, to let all of our viewers know that there are scholarships available for anyone who is willing and active in their education. So if people want to apply, what should they do? They should actually go to the website, which is www.ake foundation.org mm -hmm. and there they will find all of the information regarding the criteria for applying. Right. And the foundation is headquartered in Orangeburg. Yes right? it is. Okay. And talk a little bit more about the event in terms of tickets. Do people need okay. to purchase tickets in advance or how do they go about Well doing in fact that? if they go to the website mm -hmm. they'll find information regarding the event and they can either purchase a ticket online using PayPal, or they can mail in a check. Great. Well, any final words you want to leave us with why this foundation is so important and critical and the achievement for students? Yeah, I think when we start to look at the reason why young people are successful, mm -hmm. there's two main things that we can point to what the research tells us. One is that it's education or training. They need a way to be successful. Right. The other one is to have at least one person in their lives that's supportive. Right. So we follow the educational route. Right. Well, thank you for being with us. We certainly appreciate thank it. Thank you. When awareness returns, women who are making a difference. One woman is going the distance to educate the community about a devastating illness, and she's not stopping there. How she's making strides to help in the fight against sickle cell disease. Welcome back to Awareness. March is Women's History Month. 
We take a moment to recognize local women who are making a difference in the community and inspiring others. Today we recognize Yvonne Donald. You may not know the name, but her impact is huge. She was nominated for the Jefferson Awards by Carolyn Seabrook. Seabrook says Yvonne deserves to be recognized for her unwavering faith, caring spirit, perseverance, and commitment to addressing the myths, stigmas, and socioeconomic challenges of the devastating disease. Judy Gadsden has more. Sickle cell disease is actually one of the most misunderstood diseases, I would say, on the face of the earth. Yvonne Donald always thought she'd be a teacher. I want to try to bring this home to you a little bit. But it turns out she's more of a crusader, educating everyone who'll listen about a painful, debilitating disease that's often misunderstood. The pain with sickle cell disease is real. It's real. And it's prevalent and it's persistent. During presentations like this one at Columbia High, you can hear Yvonne's passion for erasing the stigma of sickle cell. I would think one of the biggest myths is that it's isolated only to the African American community. Sickle cell disease can strike any ethnicity, including Caucasians. And replacing it with the facts. But she doesn't just talk the talk. Walk the sickle cell. She walks the walk. Under Yvonne's leadership, the annual sickle cell walk has grown every year, raising money and awareness. As deputy director of the James R. Clark Memorial Sickle Cell Foundation, this is more than a job for Yvonne. It's her ministry. I've been sick before, Judy. I'm a 20-year breast cancer survivor. So I know what it is to be sick, and I can relate to the pain um, that these clients undergo and endure on a daily basis. And she's determined to make sure others understand it too. And I know we hear a lot about um, diabetes, um, breast cancer, and um, heart disease. But sickle cell disease is every bit as important, and it deserves the attention. Money well, raised at the walk and other events throughout the year fund scholarships to allow college-bound students to overcome sickle cell and fulfill their dreams. It's that 50% chance that the child will have traits. Every time Yvonne has a chance to talk with young people, it gives her hope about inspiring them to pursue a life of public service and maybe even more. Maybe we can ignite a little fire that some of them will pursue um, a medical field. Um, we need doctors, we need nurses, um, especially we need physicians to help um, treat individual sickle cell disease and hopefully one day researchers to find a cure. Until that cure comes, Yvonne will be a champion for the cause. It is our honor to present you with this medallion as a Jefferson Award honor. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a tremendous blessing. And I am just so thankful. I am so thankful for the goodness of God and ordering my paths. As I said, I wouldn't even be in health education had I not had breast cancer. And to me, that's a testament that sometimes something terrible can turn into something really, really wonderful. So thank you so much. <laughs> Yvonne hopes everyone who sees this story will do three things. Get tested. Knowing if you have the sickle cell trait is essential to family planning. Also, give blood. It's free and critical to treatment of the disease. And finally, consider making a financial donation. The students at Columbia High are holding a penny drive. Every single penny helps. If you know a community hero deserving of the Jefferson Awards, you can submit your nomination on our website, WISTV.com. Next week, five women will be honored at Voorhees College in Denmark. One is Wendy Brawley, co-founder of Imara Magazine. She joins Dr. Thelma Sojourner, the superintendent of Bamberg School District 2. Dr. Rita Robinson, a doctor at the Sumter VA Outpatient Clinic. Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter, a member of the South Carolina State House, and Reverend Yvonne Singleton, the interim pastor of New Mount Zion Baptist Church. This program is to honor women who have made significant contributions to society in many different areas. Judge Glenda Hatchett will be the keynote speaker. The Elizabeth Evelyn Wright Women in History celebration is on Thursday, March 19th at 6 p.m. at the Leonard Dawson Health and Human, Ser Human Resources Center. For more information, you can email the address you see there on your screen. 
and a woman who touched millions of lives with her words, Dr. Maya Angelou. We have a first look at a stamp honoring her. The Postal Service is previewing a stamp featuring an image of the late author, poet, actress, and civil rights activist with the famous quote, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. The first day of issue stamp dedication ceremony will take place on April 7th at the Warner Theater in Washington, D.C. Angelo died last May at the age of 86. Stay with us. We'll be right back with a final thought. We'd like to thank our guests this morning. As we continue to celebrate the achievements and advances by women throughout March, I leave you with a final thought this morning from educator, civil rights activist, and Charleston native Septima Clark. She talks about the importance of the NAACP and its impact on education in South Carolina during the civil rights movement. Until next time, I'm Megan Norman. This is Awareness. Why shouldn't I be a member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? I had been a member from early, in the early 19, around 1919 to be exact. Uh, it was started in 99 and around 1919 I can remember joining. And then I was directing an educational program for the NACP in Charleston and I really felt as if I couldn't tell a lie about it, which I didn't do. I don't know whether you know that questionnaires were passed out asking teachers, you know, if they were members of the NAACP. And numbers of teachers, of course, said no, because they knew that uh, they would be dismissed. And uh, it was surprising to know that there were 31 teachers from Clarendon County who decided that they would not say no, and 11 from Charleston County. And there was a three-judge court panel in uh, November of 1956, after we had received the letters of dismissal. And so, um, for that reason, we couldn't teach in South Carolina.